This is God's Planning. Get up to date on all our latest episodes at opeast.org slash godsplaining. Welcome to God's Planning. Uh, this is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic here from Washington, D.C., and I am joined uh, by Father Patrick Mary Briscoe in the uh, great north of uh, Providence, Rhode Island. He's, he's joining us from the rectory there at uh, St. Pius V. How are things going in Providence, Father Patrick? How are things going? Well, you know, we're still, um, we're still quarantined. We've had some nice weather, you know, some really beautiful spring days, thanks be to God. Um, so that's been pleasant. Been getting out we... for your runs. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, how did you know? Yep. Uh, I'm still clocking that, uh, that hearty 12 and a half minute mile, you know. I try not to brag about it because yeah. uh, <laughs> other people, you. you know, other people get embarrassed, you know, when I say that. But uh, I'm embarrassed, I, so yeah, for you. Don't yeah. talk about it. So. Naturally, yeah. Well, things in DC here are kind of same. Weather hasn't been that great. It's been like back and forth. So today's rainy. I think tomorrow kind of be nice, and then a couple of rainy days, and it's been kind of a wet. I just saw. I don't read. I found. I've realized that when I look at things online, when I kind of do my daily troll of social media. I don't click on very much except like Babylon B articles or things that have <laughs> nothing to do with like reality. Things that just kind of make me laugh. But I read headlines that are like seven words. So uh, there's something about like DC having the wettest spring in decades or years or centuries. I don't know how long, but it's been wet here. So anyways, that's DC, but we're still carrying on and uh, still quarantined and thanks be God people are still healthy and that's that. So um, yeah, so today we thought that we would talk about a, an important saint of the Dominican order. Um, it just so happens that today, uh, Thursday, April 30th, ha- is his uh, feast day, St. Pius V. I think this is the only, only the second time, correct me if I'm wrong, um, or if you remember otherwise. I think this is only the second episode we've done on, on a saint. In, obviously, we talk about the saints, but the only yeah, episode... Sure. We, we had St. Thomas back in January around his feast right. day during that week, but I don't think, I mean, we launched the podcast on the feast day of St. Dominic back in August, but we didn't have an episode specifically on, on Dominic. So I think St. Pius the fifth is nice. uh, Get him second, in. second saint. Um, yeah. So St. Pius the fifth is one of, uh, one of our Dominican popes and particularly dear to Father Patrick, as Father Patrick is the parochial vicar at St. Pius V Parish in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, he's, I mean, even this is ordained. It, we just call it the V, you know, the, mm. the, <laughs> those of us that are close to it. Pius the V. SB, you know, there are all these little things. Like, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. It's uh, really, really, um, really great how the saints are sort of exalted up there in, in Providence. You know, really, <laughs> that's right. Really held, honored. Held high. Yeah, so yeah, St. Pius V, uh, 16th century um, Dominican saint of, of the order. Um, but uh, Father Patrick is going to kind of introduce us to the man, uh, to the man Pius V. I guess he wasn't born that way, so Father, pa- Father Patrick will tell us his, uh, his name or sort of iterations of names because he became a Dominican and then Pope. And, you know, the man has, and he's Italian, so he probably has 100 names. But anyways, tell us a little bit at least about- They all end, they all end in vowels. All of his yeah, names. Eyes. Yeah, <laughs> Saint Saint Pius the Fifth was born in a re- remote little village, um, such that he would become known uh, when he became a cardinal by the name of the next closest city, which was Alessandria or Alessandrino, depending on whether you're using the Latin or the Italian. And so he was often called Cardinal Alessandrino after this city which was the closest city to his village so he's from a place yeah. so small that no one refers to it he has to get that's crazy the name of the next town over um, we at, i guess it was in it was before lent at, at the house of studies in a number of our houses we have reading at, at tables so dinner will be in silence and something will be read chosen by the superior by the prior i think i think it was earlier this spring we had a life of saint pius v read uh, at table by I believe it was a friar of the Western province. I know the author was unnamed. I think it said like a brother of that province. It like, you know, kind of mysterious, whatever. It's the biography. I don't know why someone chose to be so kind of uh, mysterious about it. But uh, when, when they were going through the names of like his birth name and then 
being called when he entered the order his religious name and then when he became cardinal being called by the town next to the town that he grew up in and then when he became <laughs> i mean it was like a whole dinner of names and like well it could be this italian name or a different one you know father patrick just listed two names for the town and i remember looking at at the friars at the table and we were all just like what like what are we it's just pious the fifth. <laughs> we're staying with pious the fifth that's it pious that's, the fifth. yeah so yes so born in this kind of obscure town, born in right? This obscure town. His his name is Anthony. That's his given name, Anthony, which Maybe. is a beautiful, a beautiful <laughs> which is a beautiful thing in its own right, because Anthony of Egypt was was the first one of the first great saints of religious life, right? Um, so he so he's the the early desert father that that bequeathed to the church monasticism, um, and Saint Anthony of Egypt gives us that. Um, well, it, it's really. Athanasius, who gives us this portrait of Anthony in his biography of Anthony. Okay, so he's born Anthony, and then when he enters the order, he takes the religious name Michael. Maybe. Michele. <laughs> Michele Gisleri, huh? Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, he so takes those are all of his names. Yeah. Well, so far. <laughs> the, ones that, the ones that we have. That's so, right. so he, so, but, uh, but he's not, he's not to the order yet. We have one, we have one or two more facts about his biography. You know, his family, like we said, they're from this um, village, which is the, which is close to a bigger town. <laughs> uh, he's very poor. And, uh, and another really beautiful thing about his early life is that he was born to a family of shepherds. Right. And so oh, I didn't know that the man who would become the universal shepherd of the church spent his early life literally shepherding. Um, and so, you know, we can think of all those beautiful moments in the Bible um, where Christ is presented as the good shepherd, where, where he gives images of the, of the church as a flock. Um, all of those are right there in St. Pius's life. Do you, remember, do you remember this homily we heard? This was probably, we were in formation at the House of Studies. Um, it might have been Good Shepherd Sunday, or it might have been the reading. I don't remember. I remember the friar who preached it. He was our student master at, when we first got to the house. So it might have been early in our first years. And he, it was, he preached about the shepherd, and his, he wanted to disabuse us of this sort of romantic idealized That's notion of the right. shepherd. That's right. Yes. And he said, yes. you know, we think of these shepherd boys with their rosy cheeks and all of this. And he said, that is not, you know, that's not who the shepherd is. The shepherd is a, is a he smells he lives with animals, <laughs> he lives outside, he's kind of a social outcast, you know, he only comes around people once in a while because he's in the mountains or in the hills and pasturing the, pasturing the sheep. And um, it gives a whole new image to the, to the, uh, to the sort of the picture of the good shepherd and then the universal shepherd and even shepherding now that it's, it's not some romantic, I mean, it's kind of gritty. And so like when the Holy Father talks about like the smell of the sheep, you know, there's, it, it should evoke not a sort of, you know, kind of nice, kind of white collar kind of, you know, we have a couple <laughs> goats in our backyard, but actually a kind of gritty and, and earthy, uh, earthy existence. It's, 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 a, it's a whole different way, I think, of thinking about it. One priest who works in a rather affluent suburb parish, uh, and he's very happy, pleased about that assignment right now, but he says uh, glibly, I can't help it if my sheep smell like Gucci and golf courses. Oh my gosh, that's, that's scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there we have there we have young young Anthony out there tending sheep. Um, he does want to pursue life as a cleric, uh, but his family doesn't have resources to send him to study. So this is the issue. Um, he he wants to learn, but but being being again from a very poor family, they don't they don't have means to send him away. And he has a chance encounter one day with two Dominican friars who are traveling not to the area. Again, this is the middle of nowhere, but through it. Mm -hmm. And they, when, when he expresses his desire uh, for the priesthood and seeing his aptitude, uh, the friars invited him to come and uh, try his formation with them. So he spent several years in a kind of pre-novitiate uh, period of study at the Dominican College in Bologna, I believe. Um, and then he entered religious life um, then he entered religious life just after that. So that would be in 1518, he sort of meets these two guys and then he makes profession in 1521. Yeah. And at the time there would have only been, been one profession. You'd have just made your, your vows. Now we have the distinction between t simple or temporary vows. And then later on you would make your final vows, your, your permanent vows in the order. But for, I mean, this, this was a sort of 
much later um, addition to religious life. So he would have entered, spent a few years in formation, and then made his his final vows just a few years later. And that that was kind of that was kind of it, um, right? So he that was kind of a quick quick period of formation for. I mean, of course, they were still studying and that sort of thing, but a quick period of formation. Indeed. Yeah. So after he entered, what, what was- After he enters, he's known for his wisdom and charity. And this is really, this is really, this really tells us something very serious about, about um, Pius V. Um, well, Mikhail Gislary, as he's known at this time. He's elected four times as prior. Now, wouldn't you say, wouldn't you say that's a remarkable thing, Father Jacob Bertrand? Yeah, yeah, I don't really, hmm. I'm not, I'm not sure as to what the law of the order were, the constitutions back then, but at least currently a friar can only serve two terms as prior, two three-year terms, and then he, he returns back to the ranks of, of, of the brethren in the community. Um, we, the Dominican order, unlike other orders, for example, the Jesuits who traditionally have a more of a hierarchical kind of governance of appointments and these sorts of things, we have a very, um, I, it's, I guess democratic, it's not really democratic, but we do elect our superiors. That's one of the rights that we treasure as Dominicans when you make your solemn vows that you have the, the ability to elect your superiors and our superiors serve short terms. So somebody to serve four terms as prior um, is, is sort of an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary testament to his, um, to his ability to lead in the way in his, the regard that his brothers have for him. Because after those, after serving two terms, you need to be elected by, by more than a majority vote. You know, you have to be, I believe it's three quarters of a vote. So there's, there's more, it's much harder to be elected again and then to be approved by, by uh, the provincial, all these things. So it really speaks to the respect that he had from, from, his, from his brothers, from, from those in, in, the, in those communities at the time. Yeah, I mean, we would disagree on the color of the grass and the color of the sky in, in our conventional meetings. I mean, this is just what it's like in a democracy. Um, and so, so really, really that he would have such a, that he would, that he would command that kind of respect from the brethren, I think yeah. really tells us about the nature of his charity and the quality of his person. Yeah, which is interesting too, because if, if we, if you look at kind of what St. Pius, um, how, how he served the church at this time, or as he kind of matured in his Dominican vocation, um, he he was appointed by Paul the um, Third to the Roman Inquisition as an inquisitor. Uh, and you know, you hear all these. So this just to be clear: Spanish Inquisition, Roman Inquisition are different things. You know, you can look at the history. You could look at sort of the um, kind of the popularized garbage about the about the Inquisition and what it was, or actual facts about that. You know, there's. You have this whole sort of spectrum of the reality and the fantasy and a combination of both and all of these things. But I think it's important what Father Patrick just said that for his life in the order was recognized for his charity and for that reason appointed by the Holy Father to serve on the Roman Inquisition, not as a sort of, you know, job to burn heretics, but to serve the church from a position of charity, um, from a position of, of respect in, in that sort of way. Um, like that story of the new sh of the good of the shepherd, the life of the shepherd kind of ought to like reorient our understanding of what a shepherd looks like. Same, I guess, as as a holy as a member of the Holy Inquisition. It, you know, this this man who is beloved and known most especially for his charity, for his love uh, for people, kind of colors the whole thing differently. There's so much going on at the church in this time too. So when he when he um, takes on this position in the Roman Inquisition. The reason there was a new Roman Inquisition was because this was part of the church's response to the rise of, uh, to the rise of Protestantism. So as questions are arising, especially theological questions are arising in light of Luther's um, theological rebellion, uh, the, ch the church has to formulate some kind of response. So the Roman Inquisition was part of that response. How can we assess um, the theology of what's being promulgated in, in, in the North in Germanic countries? Um, by 1550, though, the Council of Trent, which is, you know, the church's major full-throated response to, uh, to Luther and, and the rise of uh, Protestantism in Northern Europe, uh, by 1550, the Council of Trent is underway, and it's then that Michael Gisleri becomes appointed not just an inquisitor, but the head of the Holy Office. 
So the head, so he's not, not just the head of the whole, not just the head of the Roman Inquisition, but the head of the Inquisition throughout the church, uh, which is really a, which is really an important position at that time. Right. Um, so as we, as we get to sort of the, the climax or just to the climax of this career, as it were, just before being elected Pope, we're going to just take a break for just a couple minutes, um, get ready for, for his ascension to, to the throne of St. Peter and, uh, yeah, we'll return with that in just a minute. Hang tight. This is God's Planning. Get up to date on all our latest episodes at opeast.org slash God's Planning. Welcome back to God's Planning. Uh, I'm Father Jacob Bertrand. I'm here with Father Patrick Mary Briscoe. We are talking about his patron uh, of the of the parish where he serves in Providence, St. Pius V. Just before the break, we sort of reviewed St. Pius's early life. Uh, he currently is, we're now in the, you know, the mid 16th century at the Council of Trent. St. Pius has been made the, uh, the head of the Holy Office, directing the essentially the the on the ground response to the to the protestant reformation um throughout the entire throughout christendom throughout the entire church um so this is in uh what year it was 1555 right that he was that he was um oh no 1550 right because in 1550 right 50 and then yeah so 1550 he is appointed commissary general of the he's the head of the roman inquisition right and while he has that position in 1555, he's made a bishop. Okay, right. And so he's given, right. in addition to those responsibilities, this is amazing, in addition to those responsibilities, he has care of the diocese, the diocese of Sutri. Where is that? Admittedly, and, um, who knows? Small it's diocese somewhere. in Italy. It's yeah, very right. small. Yeah, today Sutri has, uh, Father James and I were just talking about this up here. Today Sutri has some like 6,000 inhabitants. Oh wow! Okay, it's tiny, not, tiny. Yeah, this Italy is, is not a small metropolis, diocese. right? Yeah, it's not going to rival LA for the number of yeah, Catholics or something like that. Yeah. It's not New York. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he was he was fifteen fifty five was made a bishop, and then he spent many many years as a bishop right before being or t- before yes, being that right. Elevated. It was a super long career of uh, one full year, <laughs> and then he gets elected pope. Right. And at his election to the papacy in 1556, he takes the name Pius, Pius V being the fifth Pius. Uh, why Pius, though? We're, you know, we're adding to the list of names that we were kind of joking about at the beginning of, of the podcast, but why Pius? Why does he take that? And it's also kind of a strange name, isn't it? It's to be named a virtue. It's kind of like taking the name charity or like it humility. Is. But yeah, my so mother, why Pius? My mother, we'll see, if she, we'll see if she's listening now, but my mother always spells it P-I-O-U-S. <laughs> and she addresses mail to me at the parish as if it were the virtue of religion. But um, pious in the Latin spelling, uh, the name, we typically spell it P-I-U-S. So right. there's no O in the name, right? So why does he take the name? He, you would think that he would take the name Paul. So Paul III was a kind of protector for St. Pius, someone that he really admired. Uh, but instead, he took the name Pius, it seems, out of devotion to Charles Borromeo, St. Charles Borromeo, the great saint of the Counter-Reformation, um, had a devotion to Charles Borromeo, whose uncle had been Pope Pius. The fourth, right? The fourth, exactly. Okay. So it seems, that, it seems that it's out of devotion to Charles Borromeo that he takes this name. But in a deeper way, in a deeper way, it's fitting because of his love for the observances of religious life. Um, you know, there was one time when he was an inquisitor, he was going through a Lutheran-controlled territory and um, he was warned well you're gonna have a hard go of it if you wear your Dominican habit and uh, you can imagine what his response <laughs> exactly that face exactly you can imagine Bring what his response to that Bring was it. Uh, and yeah. so he refused to take his habit off as he was traveling through a land that was difficult uh, to travel through if you were a Roman inquisitor um, yeah and and we, I People probably remember this. I'm sure you do. When when the Holy Father, the current Holy Father, Pope Francis, was elected to the papacy, there was this whole joke about you know we have a Jesuit pope who took a Franciscan name and wears the colors of a Dominican habit. Um, the pope wears white, not be- because of Saint Pius V. Is that right? Well, it seems you know that that seems like it's the tradition. Certainly, we know 
Certainly we know that Pius V refused to stop wearing the Dominican hat. So as an, as an inquisitor during that incredibly long career as a bishop, one year, uh, he, he continued to wear his religious hat. And then two, while he was in, while, while he was occupying the office of the papacy, um, he continued to wear his religious habit. So there's some kind of nod there. It, it seems that that's a little bit difficult historically to demonstrate. Uh, I just demonstrated on, it. I mean, it was fine for me. <laughs> based on the <laughs> well, well, artistic it's the evidence. Pius. Yeah. But this yeah. is the thing, this is a thing that people say. And, and it's, so it certainly represents Pius's love and his devotion to the Dominican habit. Right? Yeah. So how does that, how does that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there's another kind of cool connection to Pope Francis, though, in the life of St. Pius. Um, you know, the Holy Father, uh, Pope Francis, um, used a lot of money right away to, uh, to, uh, to advance causes for the poor of Rome, right? And that, that, was, that, was, um, that, that has been a hall, that was a hallmark of St. Pius's papacy. Mm -hmm. So rather than have the banquet that was typical of a papal election, in fact, during his predecessor's election, one of the traditions is to throw just tons of coins. You, know, you can imagine just from the balcony at St. Peter's, which is under construction at this time, um, or in the square or throughout Rome, you know, just money being thrown out and people getting trampled trying to scoop up the coins, right? Um, Pius V didn't want any of that. Instead, he took all of the money that would have been tossed in the streets and used for these lavish banquets and ceremonies and um, distributed it to the poor simply through the papal charities. So the, uh, a love for the poor of Rome was right away one of his first gestures. Um, he canceled the one-year anniversary banquet of his election and again used the money to, uh, to feed the poor in Rome. Yeah, I was going to ask what were, you mentioned his sort of, his he, him being noted for his love of Dominican life and there's the stories about the habit and whether or not the Pope wears white because of that. I say yes, Father Patrick says no, but you know- you I, said no. I said no, I said, I uh -huh. did not say no. I said uh -huh. sort of. Uh-huh, um, and then his, his, his <laughs> care for the poor and these sorts of things, but what, how else did his, did his sort of like Dominican life, Dominican identity, formation, all of these things, how did, did, did that inform his, his papacy in other ways? Yeah, absolutely. So the medieval Dominicans were known for very austere penances as well. Um, and so Pius kept those, you know, he would eat these very small meals. Uh, the medieval Dominicans, um, even the Renaissance now, 16th century Dominicans, um, kept strict abstinences from meat. They were vegetarians. And so Pius continued to observe that custom, that practice, that penitential, um, that penitential, uh, that penitential effort, um, even as Pope, right? Another one, which is a little bit odd, um, uh, Dominicans, uh, were known by, as being shod friars, so he wore shoes. But St. Dominic, when no one was looking, would take his shoes off and walk barefoot, right? This is, Especially when traveling, yeah. Yeah, right. and, and that, was a, that was a sort of penitential practice. So St. Pius had a similar kind of custom where he would take off his shoes and walk barefoot around the apostolic palace when he thought people weren't looking. And you can imagine, you know, the kind of grandeur of the of the apostolic palace, and then Pope Pius walking along cold stone. Yeah, always uncomfortable too, fun. cold and hard, and yeah, it's yeah. So wow, um, Pius Pope Pius was also known for for his reforms too. I mean, we're really in the age of reform in the 16th century, whether it's Protestant reform, you know, as so called Protestant Reformation, or the counter-reformation on the side of the Catholics, and we already mentioned the, the reordering of the, the Roman Inquisition and the Holy Inquisition and then the Council of Trent, but now, in the wake of all this, um, Pius is Pope, so he's sort of charged simply, I guess, by, by a matter of chronology and time when he's elected Pope with, with instituting the, you know, it's, it's good enough to have, it's good in one sense to have documents, but these documents need to be put in, into practice what the church is proposing to react to the Reformation. So, um, yeah, one of those one of those ways of certainly liturgical reform, right? People are used to the old right, which is called the, the Tridentine rite. So kind of universalizing the, the liturgical celebration in the church. Pope Pius was very instrumental in that. Um, and why people may wonder, well, why is that important? Well, historically, um, various regions would have their own kind of 
regional right, right? So we, um, some exist still, um, some religious orders we do, for example, have the Dominican right, so that's particular to religious order, but there, there's the Ambrosian right, for example, which still exists, and it's only celebrated in the, in the Archdiocese of Milan, named after St. Ambrose, who is bishop there. But the idea of unifying these liturgical rites is, that, is that so that Catholics throughout the entirety of Christendom would worship in the same way. There would be this, this oneness of worship and this sort of solidification of what it means to be Catholic in worship. So that's one of the things that, that, um, that pious, and you can imagine sort of the way that information and news sort of would travel so slowly that to get Gosh, something yeah. unified, it, it's not like sending out an email. You know, that the, these took months and years to do, and of course take years to kind of become enculturated and stuff, but still something that he worked for. Um, his relationship with, with his brother Cardinals was particularly unique too, wasn't it? Yeah, that was very interesting. So Pius insisted on receiving Cardinals one by one. So what would happen previously is that the Pope would set strict times and Cardinals would come, say, 10, 12 at a time. But the problem with that was that it was all very public and certain bigger players, you know, would put public, certain public pressures on the church but, uh, and on the Pope um, to undertake this or that effort uh, as opposed to maybe the reforms that needed to happen. So Pius V would receive at all hours, you know, very late into the night, um, cardinals one by one. And so that, that really represented um, and his important reform of the episcopacy as a whole, so not just cardinals, but the reform of bishops. You know, this was a problem that plagued the Renaissance Church, absentee bishops and, um, and, and titles and sees that were being handed on um, as if they were patrimony, rather than with the ideals of service and, and penance that, that are really part and parcel to uh, not just religious life, but to life, to life in the church. Yeah, sort of shepherding the people. You know, this harkens back to his childhood of, of that and the fraternity too that he that the order has you know the mendicant orders in particular have a great emphasis on fraternity um, so you can see the ways in which that kind of influenced saint pius and and, and that kind of thing so um yeah one of the most one of the most effective ways he helped the clergy and the whole was um, not just by reforming the mass but by reforming the breviary the divine office the prayers that priests and religious say every day so Pius V um, and re reformed and reissued the Roman breviary um, to give them a model of prayer to say, all right, this is, this is how the breviary is to be prayed. This is what priests, this is what is expected of you as a priest. Uh, so it was that whole kind of shape of, shape of priestly life that, that, he, that he knew and implemented. Yeah. So he, he was elected in 1556 and then died in, was it 1572? Is that when he died? I believe, right? In yeah, 1572, May, right? May 1st, 1572. Okay, but now we, we celebrate his feast day in this calendar on the 30th today. On the 30th, uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think when when we uh, gave our, when we did our, our Holy Week um, pilgrimage through through the through the major basilicas of Rome, I, I mentioned my sort of experience, my encounter with, with St. Pius V. Um, so he's, he's buried in, uh, in St. Mary Major in the Basilica, one of the, you know, the Marian Basilica in Rome. And uh, he's, he's off in a, in a side chapel. It's a pretty large side chapel, but he's still, his body is in a side chapel. And I was visiting there with another friar. It was my first time to Rome. And uh, the, we want to, I wanted to visit St. Pius V. So his, the side chapel was closed and there was, you know, there's a gold, he's kind of in, in the altar, um, kind of right in front of you, kind of in the wall. And there's like a gold case there, you know, that kind of outlines his body. So the Franciscans run the parish uh, there. Um, Dominicans hear confessions. Franciscans are uh, run, are the sacristans there. So we, the, the side chapel was closed. So we found one of the friars to let us in. We had to kind of haggle with the Italian, you know, Franciscan to find somebody with the key and unlock the gate. And, you know, fine, we finally got in and we're kneeling there in front and, and the guard, the security guard that took us over because he had these keys takes up this massive, I mean, it was probably like seven inch, maybe I'm exaggerating, but you know, you catch fish, they're, they're always bigger. This key was huge. And uh, it was like three feet long. And he, he put it into the cases that were like, you know, a foot from our faces, we were kneeling the gold case and that gold case folded down. And there's the body of St. Pius V, you know, a foot, 12 inches from our face, um, fully vested in his papal regalia. And, and there, it was incredible. I didn't expect that at all. It was really, 
is really quite awesome. He is kind of crammed in there. It's a little small. Uh, it looks, he looks a little uncomfortable, but he's still there. So pretty awesome. Um, and then too, at, at our, at the, where the order's headquarters are at Santa Sabina, that's where Pius V lived bef before he became Pope. So his cell there where he lived, his room is now converted into a chapel, but you can see the small, you can visit the small room there where, where he lived. It's pretty cool to have these, these uh, places to visit and venerate such a, such a saint and such a prolific man. Can I give you one last quote about St. Pius? Yeah, please This do. one's good. This is from, this is from um, now St. John Henry Newman. Newman says this about St. Pius V. St. Pius V was stern and severe as far as a heart burning and melted with divine love could be so. Yet such energy and vigor as his were necessary for the times. He was a soldier of Christ in a time of insurrection and rebellion, when in a spiritual sense, martial law was proclaimed. Wow, that's intense. The, the yeah. man, he's the man. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, great. Well, thanks Father Patrick for telling us about St. Pius V. He's, he's a great, great saint of our order. Um, and I know a great patron for you all up there in, in Providence. Um, thanks to you all for tuning in to this, this week's episode of God's Planning. Feel free to share it. Please do share it with, uh, with anyone you think might like to listen, might need to listen, um, anyone of that sort, where um, we are still having our Sunday Lexio series. So tune in for that. Those are put up sometime on Saturday in anticipation of, of the uh, first Vespers of, of Sunday. So um, as a way to, to prepare uh, for spiritual communion while we are still trapped in, in quarantine. Uh, Check out the Thomistic Institute and the good work they're doing there with their quarantine lectures. Um, if you're interested in other sort of Dominican resources, if you check out our provincial website, opeast.org, you can click on a link there to all of the sort of live stream masses and different um, different efforts that the friars are, are putting forth to keep people connected and praying and together in this kind of crazy time that we still unbelievably find ourselves in. So as always, pray for us. We're praying for you all, remembering you at the altar. And uh, until next time, God bless. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the province of St. Joseph. Visit us at opeast.org.